Ready? Yeah, you can slip those two. Those got it. My hey, Mark. They go right to this tight lens. Right. Do you want me to identify myself and say I'm John I... Carpenter? You want me to say it like that? Do that. that, oh, that. You can do it anyway. You're watching the L Ray Network. Here we go. For sight. And action. So it's very fitting that the man who has more films on the El Rey Network than any other filmmaker be our first guest for this first episode of our show, The Director's Chair. Welcome, John. For thank you. Us. Thank you. Thank you. So I think a filmmaker automatically doesn't know how another filmmaker does it because we all approach it differently. And The Director's Chair is about having a director interview another director and ask him questions about the craft that he normally wouldn't get. And I'll try hard not to put you up on a pedestal because I know you hate that. But when you look at your filmography, Assault on Precinct 13, Halloween, The Fog, Escape from New York, Big Trouble in Little China, They Live, and those are just a few. It's hard not to bow down at that filmography and say, wow, would have run them from someone who was very independent-minded and had an independent spirit early on before it was really fashionable and inspired a lot of independent filmmakers, myself included. And so I think maybe the best is to start off just with some of the early days. I think a lot of that is what shapes us. How early did you start becoming uh, someone telling stories visually. I was eight years old. My father had a Browning movie camera. I saw eight millimeters where I started. Then I graduated to a little bit better one. I had a Yumi, a German camera, which had a stop motion. It had a single frame on it so I could animate. And then I went to USC, graduated 16 millimeter, and then finally 35 later. What was your experience like in uh, USC? I had read somewhere that your lecturers were guys like John Ford and Howard Hawks and Hitchcock and Orson Welles. I mean, that must have been mind-blowing. The room was packed for Orson Welles. He just wanted to sit and tell stories. And he was amazing. Amazing to see him live and in person. How positive were they? Were they realistic and said, none of you will probably ever be directors? Or were they pie in the sky and said, you can all realistically get a good job here? First day of the first class, the instructor stood up and said, 99% of you won't go anywhere. You know, it's the first thing you hear. And it's like, hey, hey. But I didn't, it wasn't talking about me. <laughs> I realized in film school, oh, I can do this. Because you had to learn everything. You had to learn camera and sound and editing. I mean, even the lab. You had to learn all the aspects. They wanted you to be exposed to it. And hopefully you fall in love with one aspect of it. I loved it all. All of it. Except sound. Sound was <laughs> grim. I'll leave it to somebody else. Who are your mentors or people that you emulated? Well, really early on, Roger Corman, whose work kept being set apart from other filmmakers at the time. I realized, well, there's somebody behind the, the camera. There's somebody who's leading this, who's guiding this. And then I saw Forbidden Planet in 1956, and I thought, well, that's it. I have to do this. I must. You have a very distinct point of view that you get across. How would you describe what your worldview is that you kind of, like it or not, you have them in your movies? It's a life, your life point of view. Uh, I grew up in a really strange place, and I was a strange kid. I was afraid of everything back in those days. You know, I love for our viewers to hear that. A lot of the filmmakers that speak to young filmmakers, they feel the same way. You know, they feel like they're not in step with everyone else, and they have a lot of creativity that they hyper-focus into something, and yeah. they want it to be movies or creating film or videos, and they think there's something wrong with them. They just should know that they're just an artist. <laughs> well, hell yes. Don't worry about it, no matter what it is. If you want to create something and make something and focus on it, you can do it. Yeah. You can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Yeah. I found my love in movies and cinema. That's where the world made sense. It didn't make sense in Bowling Green, Kentucky. It made no sense to me. Right. I was completely out of place, didn't understand Jim Crow. I didn't get any of it. But in my mind, it was, of course, evil all around me. So I was like a lot of the characters in my film. Right. I was trapped in the police station. I was trapped, I was trapped somewhere. There's, a, there's, some, there's danger outside. I remember assault. It was one of the first staples of cable television. And I didn't have cable. My family couldn't afford it, but all the other kids around school were talking about this movie that was on heavy rotation called Assault on Precinct 13. And they talked about this little girl who gets shot yeah, with ice time. cream. That was Kim Richards who got shot. A little Disney girl got killed by 
Uh, that was really a brutal deal. I would don't think I'd do that nowadays. I'm older and I have kids of my own. And, but that, that back then, it was either stupid or fearless, one of the two or both. But we got an X rating for that. Is it true you had total creative control on that film? Absolutely. It's complete. Uh, that's a landmark film for you and started you on a trajectory that, that uh, kind of defined your career as far as doing these independent films uh, on a budget that was tight and providing really taut storytelling with exciting visuals for price. You could make an, uh, an inexpensive film on one set, and we did as a police station. And there was one 24-hour shooting day in the jail cells. And, oh, God. It was awful. And we were the walking dead coming out of there. Was that the last day of shooting? Yep. Okay. Very the last, last days are always day. like that. <laughs> the last days are like Man. that, as long as it isn't the start. Brutal. Brutal. And were you always going to be the composer, or how did that Well, work? I compose because I'm cheap and I'm fast. And we just didn't have any money for a composer and hiring, hiring a soundstage with musicians. To, and what kind of music should go with us all? And well, I worked with Dan Wyman, who is the uh, electronic music teacher down at USC, and he had his own equipment, all tube and uh, a knob-tuned electro electronic equipment. So I had one day to do the music on that thing. One day. Wow. Did it all in one day. But this was before I would uh, score to the image. That was later. Oh, so you didn't even... You weren't even watching the film. No, was you not were watching just the movie. watching it in your head. That's correct. Pieces that you would edit. And, That's right. And place four or five pieces. I knew I could shove in here and there for the various moods. No, I was hell, man. We barely made it. Extremely effective. <laughs> That's kind but of a great was, way to it, write. It was in this simplicity that was, that made it effective. I asked you to score one of my movies once. I wanted you as a composer. It was for Planet and Terror. I don't know if the message got back to you. I, I did. I would have done it, but I was shooting, shooting something. Something. but it was only two weeks, I thought, I'd love to. And then, as it happened, I'm sure this happened on your own movies, you don't always intend to write your own scores, but when you go over in production, the first place they steal money from is the music budget. Of course. So by the time we got done with production... Yeah, but you're accomplished, dude. You accomplished it. Was, it. And, and, and I've watched really you... I really wanted to hear your I've watched behind the scenes of you actually making music, and it's got this big board and machines, and I thought... Well, I tell you, I had to emulate a John Carpenter score. I guess we had $2 left in the budget. Yeah, so I'm like, oh, I guess I'm writing the score again. Yeah. There goes my dream. I had the crazies tempt in. Uh -huh. The crazies come out. Oh, yeah. And when I try to recreate something like that, so that thing is so layered and yeah. so complex that I just yeah, there's that's why it's effective. It's, there's a lot of musicality in that beyond anything I could ever do. So I just licensed it. So your music is in the movie, but I licensed it for this one 60 second section that is fantastic. My appreciation for you <laughs> for your music took another leap when I had to try and make actually John Carpenter score, which people would think, oh, that must be it must be simple if he's doing it himself, and it's not. It's not simple. You write for something that you know is one layer in performance, sound effects, editing, and the music fits in there. It fits in, it doesn't dominate, yet it's so memorable because it fits so well with the other parts. Is that why you like doing those jobs, just to orchestrate all those pieces? Sure. Because it's so important to the balance of it. And the music, you described it accurately, it's like, it's like laying a carpet down for a scene. Sometimes it's the simplest simplest thing. I, I had this long dialogue scene in Christine with Keith Gordon and, and John Stockwell, and they were in a car, endlessly talking. And I needed something to put under there. And I, I came up with this really simple descending business. And the mixer said, I can put this under anything, and it'll just make you watch it. And that's the whole point. Make you watch and listen to the dialogue. Right. There wasn't much to it. Didn't take much talent, but uh, that was it was right for the movie. It takes a lot of talent to be able to understate things and to be simple in approach and efficient in approach. But the biggest thing about Assault was the first time I ever shot in Panavision, an anamorphic widescreen, and I never looked back. It was eye-opening, literally. I love widescreen, unlike a lot of directors don't, but I love widescreen. And Panavision just was just the best. And so I said, no matter what, guys, we're gonna make this movie, but we're shooting it in Panavision. 
but it made your movies look huge. Make it big. They call it the budget button. Boom, hit the button on your computer now and put an anamorphic mask across your regular picture and it's the budget button because it feels big. Yes. But you all shot the real deal. We shot the real thing, which is a tiny focus. It, yeah. it, so you got a close up, you know, and you got to decide whether you want his eye or his lips. <laughs> I visited you on a set once. I and remember. You I remember. pointed out a camera you had placed really low, like a 10 millimeter lens or something with a anamorphic mask across it and I could just sit there and just stare at that shot. It was a John Carpenter shot. It was an angle that you would pick and it was a lens that you would use that's not typically used. Do you rely on the DP a lot for camera placement? I need a director of photography for lighting, mm -hmm. not for camera placement. For camera placement, this I seems know, like it's I yours. know where to go, where the it lenses. goes. You make decisions ahead of time that dictate what it's going to be. In other words, Panavision lenses. Okay, I want the ultra, the really ultra wide lens, okay? I want it up to 75 millimeter. And we can rent 180 or 100 if we have to for this particular scene. I made all those decisions. Then I just call for the lens. But once you start doing that, if you have confidence, it, it, it just gets done. It's one of the things I admire about your filmmaking is that you were always an instinctual filmmaker. It didn't feel like you were thinking about what do people want to see. You thought about what you wanted to see and the stories that you wanted to tell. That's correct. And you would live and die by your instincts. That's all you got. And the instinct is informed by everything that you have experienced, everything that you felt from being young, learning about the equipment, learning about movies. It all goes into this big pot, and that's where it comes out. You don't intellectualize it. That's what I love about it is, oh, we have to do this down here. You just know it. Yeah. You fuck up a lot and you make mistakes, but it all comes out of this instinct. That's what you've got to keep close to you. You seem like someone that was eager to use like latest technologies, like use synthesizers, use Panaglide when it was still not being used very much. Did you jump on any new toy that came out? The technical advances were all for a specific purpose. In other words, I didn't say, oh, I want to use that. Uh, the synthesizer was because you could sound big. The Panaglide, I saw a shot in, of all movies, The Exorcist 2, and it was a point of view shot of some birds coming down, and it was Garrett Brown, I think it was, running down a ramp with Steadicam. Wow. And I thought, well, that's not a dolly. It, it's just a gliding, gyroscopic feel. Oh, it's awesome. So we overused it in Halloween, used it everywhere. It was an assignment. Can you do a little $250,000 horror movies uh, called The Babysitter Murders, where babysitters are stalked? And the idea was all uh, teenagers can relate to babysitting. So that way we'll have a little exploitation hit. Sure. If you give me creative control and you let me put my name above the title, I'll do it. I don't even want any money for it, particularly. So the whole movie was designed to be made as a low budget film. And the uh, antagonist, Michael Myers, with a mask, was designed not to be a human character or a supernatural character, but a blend. And he's almost in blank because he has this blank mask on, allowing the audience to project into him. And there is one scene in the movie where his mask is pulled off and people see things, this actor, that aren't there. And dimmer in the hallway where Jamie leaves there cowering and uh, Michael Myers is behind her and we slowly dim the light up just so you can barely get an exposure on it. I don't want it to go too bright, just barely there. So come from nothing, it's just getting an exposure and then she moves and he moves out then crank it. How did it feel on the set when you were doing things like that? I mean, you saw, you saw the dailies or did you just go, wow, this is gonna be did you know it was going to work? No, I kept watching the dailies. I kept saying, rubber knife. Look at the rubber knife. <laughs> Look at the rubber knife. knife. We got this big old real knife, which you know stood in. But we didn't know. Nobody knew. Nobody knew anything. We were just a bunch of kids making a movie. And it was that the first time you put your name above? That was it, yeah. Oh, it wasn't on Assault? It was no, it wasn't. It's very marketing savvy. It really made everyone know who you were. Part of it was to establish myself as a director. Mm -hmm. 
And it, it's something I'd seen in movies when I was a kid. Alfred Hitchcock's, John Ford's, Howard Hawks's. The guys that I responded to put their names on it and taken possession of the movie. You know, this is mine. So I thought, well, I'll sneak, I sneak it in here. I can do it early. You were doing branding before people really knew what that was. I mean, Better was or really, worse, it's mine, you know. Take it or leave it. You say, I'll take all the blame or I'll take all the credit. But that's the guy who made the movie. But for a young filmmaker, like why, why would a young Hispanic filmmaker from San Antonio, Texas ever believe he could be a filmmaker? It was because of your movies. I would see John Carpenter's The Fog following. I would be, who's this guy? Wow, look, he's, why is his name above the title? Yeah. Well, look, he's writing it, he's directing it, he's editing it, he's scoring it. And it said, this guy, I would think, this guy's having so much fun. He's doing it without a studio. He's doing it independently. He's doing it with a low budget. Two hands, bootstraps, check. Got it, we can go. And it's better than the studio movies. What was it like at that time to see it with audience and see that it worked? I didn't never experienced it with an audience um, until later after it had sort of gotten word of mouth. I went to New York for a screening and I sat right outside the door and just heard the screaming. This is great. I love this. <laughs> this is awesome. So The Fog from 1980. That was a troubled film. We had to recut it. Escape from New York. That was the one that made me want to be a filmmaker. Here we go. We're set. Here we go. We're set. And action. So The Fog from 1980. What can you tell us about that? What inspired you to write The Fog, and when, when did that fall into line after Halloween? The Fog came about uh, out of a couple things. One was an experience in England at Stonehenge with fog coming in, and it was all, oh, that looks great. But that really goes back to my childhood, that The Fog has a bunch of references to old movies that I saw and loved. X, uh, X the Unknown, the, the business with the tires spinning, especially The Crawling Eye. Now, they had a cloud that moved with evil in it. Ours was just a fog with evil in it. I mean, there were, it was, again, an exploitation movie, late 70s. We shot in Point Reyes, California. It's paradise. Point Reyes Lighthouse. It's a beautiful lighthouse. Have, have you ever? Long walk. I went down there. Oh, yeah. Of yeah. course, oh, people yeah. make the pilgrimage to see your location. <laughs> At yeah, the the left walk. Down. You try it's it a couple, old. three times in a day. Yeah. It's rough. The but... equipment and everything. Yeah, yeah. And that was a troubled film. We had to recut it and reshoot. And it didn't, it didn't work the first time we finished it. But I said, this is not scary. Ghost stories are hard because they're, they have to be light. Mm-hmm. They have to be light of foot, and I wasn't. I was heavy-handed. I was heavy-handed in the music. I went back and redid it. I, I put in this scene where, where Tom Atkins tells this ghost story. It just gives it, get a buoyancy that it didn't have. Just little things. That's just so little things to get, because I, I kept thinking, that's this oh, ghost story, John. It's light. Make it small things. We can afford small things, too. And it was fantastic. I mean, not seeing any actors and seeing, like, the gas pump hit the ground, and the gas, and the credits still rolling. You're like, oh my God, what are we in for? I mean, it really was effective. All the stuff you did to it, I just really admired as a filmmaker, just going, look how he went and, and truly fixed it up and really saw how, like a sniper, you could just go in and, and take out things that didn't work. In the old days, they used to give you insert days. Mm -hmm. So they give you one day after it's all over, they pay for it, and you can come in and shoot stuff to fix what you've done and value that time, value that, because that can change a lot of things. I've always kept that in my back pocket. Let's just go back, even if it's just inserts. You can make a scene that's slow, pop a little, if you have something going on right in the middle. Yeah. Just take the attention away from it. I valued that. I remember when we started out, you know, Quentin and I both were not trained in film school. The first time we encountered a time where we both had to go do some reshooting, didn't like it at all. We thought we messed up. Something. Absolutely. You think you failed. <laughs> like, Are you kidding? Quinn said he'd gone back to the set, just didn't really want to look at anybody. He has to get like a shot that he missed. He just felt like a failure. But then, you know, you see the value. Have it in your back pocket. You know, and, and everybody will look at you and say, loser. You know, why are we back here? Why do I have to put on this makeup again? Who cares? Yeah. It's not about them. It's not about how they treat you. You gotta you gotta see. 
You gotta be able to see what the movie is. That's the secret of it. How you don't learn anything in film school that can teach you how to do that. You have to be able to see the whole movie and see your footage and see what works and what doesn't. Oh boy, that read so well on the paper and it's just not working. Let's fix it. Escape from New York. When I first saw the movie, it just blew me away. It was so much at once. John Carpenter's Escape from New York, Maximum Prison, that's New York City. Mm. I was like, you can do that? You can just say New York's a prison and you're, you create your own rules? Yep, that's it. It opened up so many ideas. Yeah. And my very first film was after I saw Escape from New York. I had a Super 8 and it didn't have stop motion, so I would have to tap. Sure, sure, I try to get it, yeah. I had the vinyl record of Escape from New York as the backdrop and a claymation in front of that, just so I'd have a good background. I used the Statue of Liberty head as the background, and I did my first claymation. Oh, that's great. That was my first film, was actually right at, that's how inspired wow. I was by Escape from New York. Was but you burst, just burst uh, Burst camera. of, wow. just, just, just see if it worked. That was the one that made me want to be a filmmaker. Escape from New York was born of two things. One was me seeing Death Wish with Charles Bronson. And the second thing was a novel by Harry Harrison, a science fiction writer, where there's this planet that exists that has, it's incredibly dangerous. So who are you gonna send in there? You send in the baddest guy in the universe. Kurt Russell got to play this badass, which is hilarious. And we got to play around with uh, New York jokes, because I'm not a big fan of New York. I just thought it sucked there. <laughs> really sucked. That you made a movie like Escape from New York uh, independently seemed just unfathomable. It was a $7 million budget? Five. Five? Oh, five, okay. And um, seven week shoot? I think so. Read somewhere that was seven, which is a hellacious schedule for nights because everything has to be lit. Must have been a tough shoot. St. Louis had a big fire in the 70s. It burned out the, in the middle of the city. So they let us take down signs and power lines they'd let us do anything we wanted it was fabulous it's paced relentlessly and you kill like four major characters in the last 10 minutes and so it just feels like all bets are off it's really well done and it's not enough to just say there's a bomb under the table you really have him clocking his watch the whole time you always know something's at stake how did you orchestrate that but you have the secret you you look at it holistic the whole movie the whole movie has to flow to that one moment. There's one thing I wish I had done. I wish I had superimposed a ticking clock over the last part of the movie, his t life clock, ticking down, tick, tick. That would have even jacked it up a little bit further. I think what was nice that you didn't know. You That's were like, true. You were That's like, true. holy crap, He's, he must be out of time by now. Uh, you know, you can't which keep is, track which of it. Is it's also really yeah. weird, but it, it worked. But, but you have to look at the whole, it's the whole adventure you know, from, from the start to the finish. And, and you just, you take each piece of it, but it's all directed to that moment where he's, you know, somehow saved. There's okay. so many homages to Escape from New York in my films. Some of them are intentional, some of them are not. I went back and looked, and I was like, oh my God, I mean, in all of them from, I showed you a picture from El Mariachi of, we were so excited, the gun that we borrowed from the cops was Snake Plissken's uh -huh. gun. Planet Terror, even Spy Kids from Machete, there's direct, <laughs> exact copy of the shots. What do you think of imitation, and, and is imitation flattery? I'm hoping you say yes. Of course it is, of course it's wonderful. But you know what, well, all, we all imitate, every, every artist imitates something. Music, paintings, movies, books and stories. All of us, we take a little bit with us, that's what's so great about art. It's the, it's the human existence. There you have it, right up in front of you. We're putting it up there, artists put it up there. And you can take a little from it. Don't take too much, just take a little here or there. Just a bit. So I just have to ask, um, what did ever happen to Fresno Bob? Well, I can't tell you here, but it was bad. Well, this, it was very this bad. Be, this would be the place to say it, because our audience is wondering. This Fresno be, Bob. What did they do to him? Fresno Bob was, uh, gang raped and then set on fire. <laughs> I never would have, never would have thought. <laughs> I don't know what he happened to him. <laughs> it was purposely mysterious, like, like Kurt's character. 
That's wonderful. So you know that you don't have the answers to a lot of those questions. No. You'd put in knowing that the audience doesn't need to know. It, it's just, it plants a seed and then it... And, and it plants a jumping off point. Oh, wow. There's a, there's a life there. The thing. How grueling was it in British Columbia? I just thought... Oh. Tell us about They Live. Start questioning reality that you see. Here we go. We're set. Here we go. We're set. And action. This was your first major studio film. The Thing. The Thing was a hard movie to make. It was a grim movie in many ways. The whole theme of it, loss of identity and the end of the human race. And I just dove right into that. You know, let's do that. And uh, that didn't make the audience feel too happy at the time. They wanted something that was an up cry. And they got that with E.T., not with my film. I thought this was my best movie. I still, part of me thinks it is. I just looked at it and wondered how you got all those actors and shot all those actors together. It's like doing a dinner scene every scene you have <laughs> and trying to cover that. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Draw a circle and be inside the circle. That's how you do it. It's really, you can point the camera anywhere. Right. If you stand outside the circle, you're... The thing was the first real time people saw, like, the creature. They saw it. In the them, light. And they didn't know. Click. Here it is. If that was right or wrong or what, it was just new. And it was different. And it was challenging. And Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Completely. You were doing something that people hadn't done before. They there weren't was supposed to do. Big it. argument on the set between Rob Bottin and Dean Cundy. And Rob wanted to take all the light off his stuff. It's all behind it. Everything's backlit. Everything's dark. It has to be a radio show, he says. Dean Cundy sa said, rightly, we're bringing this out under these lab lights, man. We're bringing it out for you to take a look at. And it, a lot of really upset people at the time, a really upset people. Well, it was just ahead of its time. And you shot on location a whole different uh, second act. We had really some powerfully written scenes that just made the movie just drop like a rock. The only chance we had to shoot any of that stuff was out there on the glacier in British Columbia. That's where we shot it. And there's one scene where Kurt explains what's going to happen and, they, and everybody's surrounding him. And we shot it in a snowstorm. And it's just, you can feel it. And it's a real simple scene, but it was really worth it. Your first studio film was also the first time you didn't write a script of your own. And it's the first time you didn't write a score of your own. Was some of this because of the studio system? Yeah. Yeah. But, look, I got to work with Ennio Morricone. I'd heard a story that you had the music done and then you said, the theme's too complicated, and then you showed like how to make it simpler, and it's the theme that comes up, the dum, 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 dum. Was that your contribution? No, no, I went to visit Ennio Morricone in Rome. He had come up with some ideas, and they were very florid piano stuff. And he couldn't speak English, and I couldn't speak Italian, so to a translator, I said, less notes, simple. So he came up with the, the theme that we all think of. That was all him. I heard an interview where you said, I don't want to go into the, how grueling it was in British Columbia, but how grueling was it in British Columbia? Just so our audience can get that story. What was that in British uh, Columbia? So? It's grueling weather, cold, it's miserable, Cameras are freezing, so you have to leave them outside. It's uh, at the top of this mountain. It's a mine, and every day they, these trucks loaded come roaring down the mountain. The actors had to drive in a bus to the location, and they almost went over the edge of the Stewart Highway because the driver kind of panicked. So they all got out and pushed the bus on. I mean, it was, every day was like this, but we survived it. They Live. They Live was a primal scream against Reaganomics. Just this worship of greed and money. And luckily, I found Roddy Piper it was a wrestler. But he looked like a, like a working man. He didn't look like a pretty boy. Yeah. One thing about They Live to realize is all the aliens, all of them, are played by the same person. <laughs> Jeff Amata, our stud coordinator. He played the women, he played oh. the men. 
He played everybody. He could fit in the mask, and he was absolutely perfect. The famous fight scene yep. that goes on forever. Yep. When they first showed it to you, was it not that long, and then you decided to make it longer, or was it just long, and you said, keep going? Or at what point did you say, you know what, let's keep going, let's make it longer? I wanted, always wanted it to be long. It was written specifically, uh, page after page, just said, the fight, continued. The fight. Continued. Okay. <laughs> so they knew they had they this had to showcase. We have a professional wrestler here. He can do this. He knows how to do it. And it was great to shoot. It was fun and liberating. I mean, you know, nobody does a fight for that long, so. And it just keeps going and it keeps going. And it's over nothing. Put these sunglasses on. No, I don't want to. Put them on. No, it's it's a battle of wills. I wanted so badly a pair of sunglasses just okay. like those when I yeah. walked down because you wanted yeah. to go around and do that. And check it's it all still out. really effective. I showed my kids that. And it blew their minds. They had never thought of messaging like that. And, and they kept looking at each other. And when it said, yeah, this yeah. is your God, the dollar, it just, it just you, you changed. <laughs> but the idea was that you start questioning reality that you see. Inspired Shepard Fairey and his obey imagery. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, hey, I've had my primal scream. I'm going to shut up now. It's a great scream. Thanks. Big Trouble in Little China. This was a Hollywood kung fu movie. It was irresistible. Here we go. For sec. Here we go. For sec. And. Action. Big Trouble in Little China. When the, the three guys go and kidnap the girl at the beginning, when they first spot her, and it's the low John Carpenter angle, and the music starts, they start moving, and the camera starts dialing. And you're just like, oh my god, we're in John's world. What? This was a Hollywood kung fu movie with a ghost story and an action film. I was irresistible. So this came across your desk. You never get scripts that are good that's anymore. It. That's it. it was, I was wow, like, look at this thing. <laughs> and I, I watched a lot of Chinese kung fu movies to kind of see, well, what, what's, how, what's going on? There was a, an innocence to these movies that just was breathtaking. In the performances, in the way they staged it, they haven't been cursed with the sophistication of the West. They are full out. Yeah. There's something freeing about that. I think that was the thing about Big Trouble. It was, you can be free with this kind of abandon. I mean, you had all the studio behind this. They wanted to make it. They wanted Indiana Jones. That's what they thought they were going to get. They got a wholly different film. They got an independent <laughs> film from an independent mind. It's they incredible. got Kurt Russell thinking he's a hero and not realizing he's the sidekick in the movie. Complete incompetent blowhard. Kurt was delivering a sort of John Wayne, but uh, a terrible John Wayne. Just an awful, <laughs> dumb John Wayne. You people sit tight, hold the fort, and keep the home fires burning. And if we're not back by dawn, call the president. And we just went with it. And it was also fun just to give so many props to the martial artists. We had a bunch of masters on that movie who really knew their stuff. Did you bring in real guys who knew how to do wire work like that? Or? No, no. We had a guy who could fly you. Mm -hmm. But we did it the old-fashioned way. We basically used trampolines and, you know, takeoffs, mid-air landings. We couldn't do a Crouching Tiger, Hidden hidden Dragon, because that was the ultimate. You know? they used I mean, they're flying across vast distances. Yeah. I would have killed for that, but <laughs> it was a big-time movie. I had a blast doing that movie. It was really fun. It looks like it. It looks like you and Kurt were just having a great time. A great time. And it was different from you, having done Napoleon and Snake. Here's this guy that goes over here, yeah. And was it written like that a lot in the script? You all play with that a little bit? Just we played with it a lot. Different? You wanted to do something different with yeah. the lead hero? It, it wasn't written seriously, but it was quirky. Yeah. But And I've got to say, Kim Cattrall just was a great comedian. I mean, she's not given enough credit. She was great in that movie. The way she would she would deliver lines really unexpectedly, like, really? Wow. <laughs> well, that's out of nowhere. But she was really a talented actress. I really loved working with her. What's your favorite, what's your favorite part of the process? I love the crew. I love the cast. I'm inspired by the cast because they bring it. When you have really good actors, that's nothing better. What is your process working with your actors? Well, we rehearse first. What are you coming in with? What are your ideas? 
how much do I have to teach here? Do I have to teach how to hit marks, which I have? Can this person walk and talk? You suss out the entire situation and see where people are coming from. And what could I do to make you the best you can be, first of all, but fit into my movie? Some people you really want to work with over and over again. Let's we'll get this down. Because I know you can be brilliant here. It's usually simple things. Yeah. Walking, looking, slowing it down or speeding it up. A lot of that's just based on instinct. You're picking somebody off oh, your instinct. Oh, well, we keep coming back to that. Ideas and instinct. That's what it's There's all about. There's no way you'll know what you're going to get. Uh, well, sometimes I didn't. Uh, and, and, uh, and one actress, I had to replace her because she couldn't do it. Could not do the part. And uh, you just do the best you can with it. That's all you can ever do is the best you can. You are endlessly inspiring. You were the only guy doing it. I mean, for me, just, I, I, I loved a lot of directors' work, but you were the guy who was doing it independently for so long, doing the multiple jobs and keeping your productions tight. What I loved about your approach to independent filmmaking is you didn't look at your budget and go, let me make a movie accordingly. You made big ideas. Your ideas were much bigger than the budgets allowed. And that is it's so hard to teach people that. People didn't believe my first movie was for $7,000. Say, well, had you read the script, you wouldn't have budgeted it that way. I was reaching to do something beyond my budget. I'll just keep the budget lower so we can just have creative freedom. That's smart. Do That's it. smart. Let the ideas be big, but don't make the movie big. And I learned that. Yeah, but you see, but you see, you're discounting what happens to people when their ego gets involved in movie making. And the idea is that if their budget is big, I must be big. Or the movie will be better. Or it's always will be better, or story. if I have this deal, then I am hot, whatever. But you see, um, that it has nothing to do with it. That's and nobody cares about that. Yeah, they care about what's on the screen. I had to look up which one of your movies were studio films because it, it you felt even though you were doing a studio film, it still felt independent minded. And that you, you, I know the studios are different now, but at that time, they made decisions and took risks on movies. Nowadays, there are no risks taken. It's all producers have to take the risk. So it's much different. But they actually gambled on things, especially in the good old days. They gambled. Riverboat gamblers. When an instinct didn't pay off with the box office, did that give you a, a hit that made you question your instincts some after that point? You do. But by that point in my life and in my career, I was committed. I mean, what am I going to do? Am I going to become a whore? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay with it. I lost jobs. I, my career went a different trajectory. That's all, but that's all part of the game, you know? But the one thing you can they cannot take away from you is this instinctual feel of this is my movie. Here it is. I'm making this movie for a horizon that maybe we don't see right now. I want this movie to last. And I'm here for a short period of time on this earth, and by God, I want to do it the way I want to do it. And uh, it may not be what you like and what you want, but... <laughs> Part of the segment that we're going to do on this show is ask uh, other directors who want to ask you questions that I, I sent out an email to to send me your questions for John Carpenter. Here we go. We're set. Here we go. We're set. And Part of the segment that we're going to do on this show is ask uh, other directors who want to ask you questions that I, I sent out an email to to send me your questions for John Carpenter. So, uh, Greg Nicotero, a friend of yours, has worked on your films and mine in the special effects department, has become a director in his own right on Walking Dead, asked if you could address the fans or critics. What is the one thing you would say to enlighten them to something they maybe misunderstood in one of your films, just to set the record straight or tell them? Look, man, what you see is what you see in my movies. I can't. If you misunderstand it, it's my fault. Nicotero, he had to be sponsored for the DGA, and you were his sponsor. And uh, when he asked you to be a sponsor, you asked him a question. You asked, why do you want to be a film director? It's a great question. I don't know what his answer was, but he would like to know what your answer would be to that. My answer to why I wanted to be a film director, I had no choice. I fell in love, right. fell in love with movies, with cinema. And things exist in cinema that don't exist in other places, in, in real life. I don't 
believe in the supernatural in real life, but it lives in the cinema. It, it inhabits movie houses. And that's, I mean, you can't not go where you love. Edgar Wright, he gave you a, a Blu-ray oh, yeah. for, for World's End. He wanted to preface his question by saying he's a huge fan, even though you know he directs mostly comedies, you've had a huge influence on the way he works. I met this director, I met yeah. Edgar in a, in a video store. I told him I loved his stuff. I don't think he believed me. He said, you're one of the first directors that he grew up with that could establish as having an authorial stamp. The 2.3 ratio, your scores, your choice of fonts, the enigmatic ending. He loved it and it made him want to take ownership of his movies. Um, how important was it from the start to develop this style? Were you influenced by the other film directors to do this or other artists of a different medium? It was important to show there is a person behind these movies. There is a person doing this. I would control the font, the, put my name above it, the, the look, and some of the thematic concerns carry over from movie to movie. It was important uh, to do all these things for me because of parts of what I learned in film school. They, uh, the directing teachers beat into your head of how quickly you can lose control, how quickly that can happen if you give over certain elements of the movie that you care about. So you gotta decide, what do I care about in this? What's the most important thing to me? A final cut, obviously, is the most important thing any director can have. Isn't given, you try to seize it. If you can't get it in, in writing, you seize control from the set. But that's also just part of what I think cinematic storytelling is all about. You just gotta do it. You got to do it. I have to do it. Other people are more successful uh, working with others, not me. Josh Trank is a young uh, filmmaker. He did Chronicle, this movie called Chronicle. He knows that you're a big video game fan, so he thinks you must realize how much you've influenced things like Mortal Kombat and the Metal Gear Solids. What do you think about the similarities of these and and you play these games and do, what do you think about the video game as a storytelling tech medium anyway? It's fabulous and it's in infancy. And, and storytelling through video games, Roger Ebert said it will never be art. I think he's wrong, he was wrong. It was just, it's just beginning. Eli Roth, horror yeah. director now, he's a great, great guy. He'd love to know, back when you were one of the founding fathers of modern horror, when you made your early films, did you have any idea horror would evolve? into where it is today. Horror has always been the same. It will always be with us. It, it was around at the beginning, the birth of cinema. Edison did a Frankenstein. It's one genre that translates around the world. Big monster comes through the door, everybody in every country jumps up and screams. It's a universal language. You don't want to make horror movies to make money. You don't want to make horror movies to be popular. You want to do it because you have a story to tell. You have an idea. You can take something and turn it and make the audience go with you. It always has and it always will. Horror lives forever. Yes. Your movies stand the test of time because they are unique. This is John Carpenter. Privileged to have him here on El Rey and here with us on the director's chair. Glad to be here. Thank you, senor.